right, uh, 23. Yep. Yep. Very yeah, very good. This is this is good for desmoplastic melanoma. Um, probably the first thought at low power because you've got a spindle cell proliferation effacing the dermis that going down into the subcutis even with a prominent nodular lymphocyte aggregates. Look, it's going all the way down deep subcutis and it's still going, still going all the way down to the fascia. And we still have atypical spindle cells there. So that's a classic growth pattern for desmoplastic melanoma. This one may have some slightly more plump cells in it that could actually be a combined mixture of, oh no, maybe it's just cross-section of these spindle cells. And um, uh, we do make a distinction between spindle cell melanoma, which is much more cellular and looks a lot like, a, looks like AFX or like a sarcoma. Um, and then desmoplastic melanoma where the cells sometimes, th this in this case, they're they're kind of plump and obviously atypical, but sometimes the atypia is more subtle. They can be like very neural looking, but the cells are divided from each other by intervening collagen, often with a bit of bluish myxoid background. Lymphocyte aggregates, if you have a big enough sample, almost always present, although on a small shave biopsy, uh, these, especially subtle cases, can be extremely difficult to diagnose. Thankfully, this one has very very obvious atypia once we look around. And again, you may have to hunt around for a while, but usually you will find mitoses. Um, and if you have a big enough sample, perineural invasion is usually present. Desmoplastic melanomas uh, love to have invasion around nerves like this right here is probably a big nerve that has been replaced. I don't know 100% for sure, but it, it really is suspicious for that. Um, so uh, nerve involvement and replacement. This area is getting more cellular and almost to the cellularity closely approaching a spindle cell melanoma, but most of this is hypocellular and, and desmoplastic melanoma. Most of the time we see these on the, the head and neck of older sun damage patients, but I think this one looks like it's on the trunk. And so sometimes you can see them in other contexts. They may or may not have a melanoma in situ component. If you're lucky and you get that, that's very helpful clue to the diagnosis, but about half of cases lack um, an in situ component and they, um, uh, pure desmoplastic melanomas, when, when greater than 90% uh, of the tumor is made of, a, of this hypocellular desmoplastic uh, component, uh, they usually, uh, if they don't have an in situ component, they usually will not have pigment production, which is how you can tell them apart from, say, blue nevus variants, plus they're more atypical. Um, uh, they, but they can be really hard because clinically they can look like a scar. Microscopically, they can look like a scar or a reactive process. Very difficult. I have many videos and cases posted online about desmoplastic melanoma. It's a, a, one of the more challenging diagnoses to make, I think, in, in spindle cell uh, dermatopathology. And they, a pure desmoplastic melanoma will just stain with S100 and SOX10, just like a nerve sheath tumor would, which further complicates them. They will be negative for MART1, negative for HMB45, because they're kind of more primitive, like it's like almost they've reverted back towards their neural crest origin. They look neural, they stain more neural, very difficult. And when they're pure, they have a lower risk on a depth by depth basis. They seem to have a somewhat better behavior than conventional um, uh, epithelial melanomas or more cellular spindle cell melanomas. They have a tendency for local recurrence, but less tendency for um, metastasis. It's still a serious diagnosis, but but a somewhat better prognosis on on compared to other melanomas of the same Breslow. Unfortunately, though, these are often, by the time they're diagnosed, you know, 10, 15, 20 millimeters thick, all the way down the fascia, which is a, a bad problem.